Greetings from Cyberdelic Space. This is Lorenzo, and I'm your host here in the Psychedelic Salon. And I'd like to begin today by thanking Jeffrey D. and Philip A., both of whom made donations this past week to help offset some of the expenses involved in distributing these podcasts. Your contributions uh, really mean a lot to me, and I appreciate you taking the time to uh, help keep these podcasts winging their way out into cyberdelic space. Now today I'm going to take you back once again to the 1996 conference from which we heard Sasha Shulgin's talk a couple of weeks ago. And again, I want to thank Phil B. for sending me a copy of this talk. And uh, Phil, for what it's worth, I know that you were at the conference those many years ago, and uh, as I've said before, it turns out that so is the woman who is now my wife. At long last, I'm uh, finally catching up to things that you two learned long before I did. Actually, uh, this is the first talk of that weekend conference, and it was given by the MC for the weekend, Jonathan Ott. Now, I want you to know that this is a different version of a Jonathan Ott talk from the one that I first experienced when I heard him speak for the first time at the Entheobotany Conference in uh, Mexico in 1999. That morning, uh, he came into the big room we were all in and sat on a small wooden desk up front. In fact, he sat cross-legged on the top of the table, and his back was ramrod straight, and for over an hour he gave what I still consider to be one of the most detailed and elegant descriptions of psychedelic plant life in the jungle that I've ever heard. And he did it all without notes, uh, same way that Terrence used to talk. I thought at the time, and I still think, that he is perhaps the most intelligent person I've ever met. So when I previewed the talk that I'm about to play for you right now, I was uh, somewhat taken aback to hear him reading it. At least it sounds as if he was reading from a prepared text. Even so, uh, after listening to it twice now, I can't wait to hear it again. And I hope that you like it as much as I do. Oh, uh, by the way, uh, for this talk by Jonathan, you won't have to be able to understand science and botany, because uh, today, Jonathan Ott is about to give our community a little history lesson about the tribe. Welcome to Entheobotany, Shamanic Plant Science. I want to thank you all for coming. I'm Jonathan Ott, and I extend this uh, welcome on behalf of my co-organizers of the conference, Ken Symington and Rob Montgomery, and of course also on behalf of all the faculty members that have come, and we all thank you for making this event possible. I want to mention briefly, I don't really have time to talk much about the background of this, but there will be time for that probably tomorrow morning because... I'm also introducing myself as first speaker. And we have an action-packed program, and uh, I I don't want to start out by taking an hour and a half for mine and setting a bad example as far as disciplining the other speakers, some of whom are notably long-winded. Actually, they can hold a candle to me in that regard. And so um, I just want to mention that we're very pleased to be presenting an art exhibit of uh, entheogen-inspired or related artwork, which is in the lobby. And uh, so please, uh, if you haven't already taken a look at it or a good close look, it certainly merits attention. So uh, as I say, I'll just give my presentation, which is called The Natural Paradises, and uh, then I will be in turn introducing the other speakers. Two decades have passed since the American anthropologist Peter First characterized shamanism as a Pangean Ur religion of extreme antiquity, extending at least 50 millennia into our past. In the ghost dance, The Origins of Religion, fellow anthropologist Weston Labar proposed as much, offering elaborate details. Both First and Labar acknowledged the fundamental importance of the innovative work of R. Gordon Wasson in the formulation of this astonishing insight. Wasson, a banker and pioneering ethnomycologist, devoted his life to documenting the survival of shamanism, to exploring a unified field theory of the connection between shamanic ecstasy and religion. Wasson summarized this revolutionary discovery with disarming simplicity. Shamanism is the convenient name that we give to the religious experience of the Stone Age, and its key is ecstasy, rapture. Fortunately for us, the cult of the entheogen did not die out in prehistory. 
Shamanism lingered on here and there, reaching as with fingers down the corridors of time into early history. I suggest that it survives to this day in the secret rites of the divine mushrooms in Mesoamerica. Wasson was later to characterize pre- and proto-history, or perhaps more to the point, the pre-literate history of all peoples, as the age of entheogens, which lives on in Amazonia and the remote mountains of Mexico and elsewhere. I have sometimes asked myself whether the unlettered ages, stretching back through eons of time, were not those belonging peculiarly to the entheogens, the age of entheogens. The mysteries of Eleusis began in the unlettered past of the amazing Greek people, then persisted for a few centuries under an hermetic seal of secrecy into an age of glorious letters. The Soma of the Vedic hymns knew its heyday before the Aryans learned their letters, but it disappeared with the coming of the alphabet. Although Eliad conceived of the shamanic use of what he indiscriminately called drugs or narcotics as decadence, as a vulgar substitute for pure trance, we now know this to have been a colossal error, a classic example of failing to see the forest for the trees. With the blinders and tunnel vision characteristic of academic over-specialization, alloyed with prejudice derived from Western society's pharmacological Calvinism, and lacking the most rudimentary knowledge of pharmacology or the history of inebriants, Eliad ham-fistedly described as degenerate use of the sacred plants whose visionary effects were the very essence of shamanism, as vulgar, what Gordon Wasson was to identify four years later on the basis of his personal experience with Mazatec shaman Maria Sabina as religion pure and simple, free of theology, free of dogmatics, expressing itself in awe and reverence and in lowered voices, mostly at night, when people would gather together to consume the sacred element. Having experienced ecstasy at first hand, on the night of 29 June 1955 in a remote village in the mountains of southern Mexico, Wasson astutely recognized in the humble person of the preliterate Mazatec Indian curandera Maria Sabina, the shaman, the focus for the woes and longings of mankind, back, back through the Stone Age to Siberia. She was religion incarnate. She was the hierophant, the thaumaturge, the psychopompos, in whom the troubles and aspirations of countless generations of the family of mankind had found were still finding their relief. All this I saw in the light of that one match, in the shadow performance of Maria Sabina. The light of that match seemed to last an eon of time, and then suddenly it was out. While many scholars of early humankind, like Eliad, were made uncomfortable by the Wasson theory, their colleagues of greater vision described therein a skeleton key to unlock the hermetic seal of secrecy, veiling the spiritual world of preliterate peoples from our sight. To Levi-Strauss, Wasson's was a revolutionary hypothesis, and Labar saw in Wasson's work an object lesson to all holistic professional students of man. Labar explored Wasson's nexus between entheogens and shamanism and between shamanism and religion in his monumental The Ghost Dance. With the passing years, the Wasson theory has become so widely accepted by specialists as to be considered beyond serious dispute. Shamanism is the earliest manifestation of culture, the shaman the first professional and precursor of the priest, physician, musician, and every artist alike. Visionary ecstasy is the primal heart and soul of shamanism and religious revelation, and the use of entheogenic plant sacraments is the most archaic, fundamental, and pangean or universal, not to mention effective technique for the induction of shamanic ecstasy. There could be no more appropriate designation for our millinery preliterate past than the age of entheogens. The symbolic demise of the age of entheogens in Paleogea, or the Old World, occurred at the end of the fourth century of our era when the Christian Alaric Goths overran the sanctuary at Eleusis putting an end to an organized mystery religion two millennia old, centered on an annual rite in which initiates or mystai imbibed the kikion, an entheogenic potion which transformed them into epoptai, who had seen tahira, the holy. This momentous event stands as a portentous symbol of the death of ancient religion and the inauguration of the pharmacratic inquisition. Although the age of entheogens lived on in Paleogea for perhaps another millennium, the demise of the Eleusinian mysteries told its death knell. The Christian's enmity is easy to explain. 
since they were promulgating a religion in which the core mystery, the holy sacrament itself, was conspicuous by its absence, later transmogrified by the smoke and mirrors of the doctrine of transubstantiation into a specious symbol, an inert substance, a placebo and theogen, the imposture would be all too evident to anyone who had known the blessing of ecstasy, who had access to personal religious experiences. Thus, a concerted attack on the use of sacred inebriants was mounted, and the supreme heresy was to presume to have any direct experience of the divine, not mediated by an increasingly corrupt and politicized priesthood. The pharmacratic inquisition was the answer of the Catholic Church to the embarrassing fact that it had taken all the religion out of religion, leaving an empty and hollow shell with no intrinsic value or attraction to humankind, and which could only be maintained by hectoring, guilt-mongering, and plain brute force. <laughs> While the world was to endure an incredible profusion of pogroms and organized and unorganized inquisitions throughout the millennium aptly characterized as the Dark Ages, directed here against vestiges of pre-Christian pagan philosophy, there against rival faiths like Judaism, Manichaeism, Islam, or the nascent stirrings of science and rationalism, there existed continual and vigorous pressure against ecstatic religions and practitioners of traditional herbal lore. Thus, diviners, healers, and midwives, exponents of the shamanic arts, were dragged to the stake among the Jews, Manichaeans, Muslims, alchemists, political dissidents, epileptics, criminals, harridans, business rivals, and anyone else whose misfortune it was to become a scapegoat for any problem. The witch's garden was plowed under by an evil force, which conceived of human beings as sheep and used their bodies to fuel the fires of ritual purification. By the advent of the 16th century, Europe had been beaten into submission, shamanic ecstasy virtually expunged from the memory of the survivors, and the shamanic pharmacopoeia all but forgotten. The age of entheogens yet lived on in Neogea, or the New World, However, and European seafarers abruptly came face to face with their own pagan heritage, with people having direct experience of the divine, mediated not by ignorant priests, but by a bewildering array of entheogenic plant teachers. Troubled churchmen uneasily saw in this a diabolical parody of their cherished holy communion, blissfully unaware of the fact that it was rather their own placebo sacrament that was a decidedly unholy parody of humankind's immemorial communion with sacred plant teachers. We might date the advent of the pharmacratic inquisition in Neo Gia to 1521 when Cortes' ragtag band of outlaw conquistadores established dominion over the Aztecs, consummate virtuosos of the entheogenic arts and sciences. On 16 June Oh, sorry, 19 June 1620 in Mexico City, the Inquisition formally decreed that use of shamanic inebriants was heretical. It bears witness to the sincerity and integrity of the Mesoamerican Indians that they continued to commune with their traditional sacraments in defiance of this decree, braving torture and hideous execution. Over the next 265 years, there were at least 90 autos de fe for use of peyotl or peyote and numerous autos de fe involving teonanacatl, the sacred mushroom, and ololiuki, the holy morning glory seeds. The Inquisition eventually ran out of steam, failing to extirpate the use of plant sacraments in Mexico but succeeding in driving this underground. Nevertheless, Protestant missionaries have continued the pharmacratic inquisition with undiminished zeal, like their Catholic predecessors blissfully ignorant of any irony involved. As one missionary noted, and I quote, the partaking of the divine mushroom poses potential problems in relation to the Christian concept of the Lord's Supper, to say the least. <laughs> Contemporary prohibition of entheogenic and other psychoactive drugs dates from 1 March 1915 when entered into force the Harrison Narcotic Act. Although the Constitution itself had to be amended to prescribe alcohol, the U.S. Supreme Court in 1919 upheld this federal statute prescribing narcotics and the arrogation of broad federal police powers in the matter of dangerous drugs. The concept has achieved the status of tradition in the United States, which has exported its anti-drug crusade worldwide. And the legislation currently in force, the Comprehensive Drug Abuse Prevention and Control Act of 1970, provides for prescription of any substance the government wishes to add to its schedules. Indeed, the Controlled Substance Analog Enforcement Act of 1986 
boldly penetrates into areas of governmental control over research undreamed of by any national socialist, communist, or other dictatorship, presuming to declare any, quote, human research with new drugs, unquote, unlawful unless explicitly approved by the government. While the original impetus for anti-drug legislation involved struggles for world dominance, not to mention economics and racism, it triumphed on the tide of reformist zeal of fundamentalist religious minorities intolerant of diversity. Albeit tricked up as public health laws addressing so-called crimes against health, contemporary drug prohibition is merely the modern expression disguised by secular circumlocutions of the millennial pharmacratic inquisition. We must not lose sight of the fact that, like the decree of the Spanish Inquisition in Mexico in 1620, contemporary legislation, whatever its justification, has the effect of prohibiting ecstatic experiential religion while simultaneously promoting exsanguinated, desacramentalized simulacra of religion. The secular American state is clearly comfortable with purely symbolic Christian non-religion, but feels rightly threatened by ecstatic religion grounded in individual religious experiences, which lead people to examine their own assumptions and motivations and those of their churches and those of their governments. The differences between blind obedience and eternal skeptical questioning and distrust of authority. Not only is the pharmacratic inquisition alive and well on the threshold of the new millennium, but it has been enshrined in the secular law of one of the world's most secular states, whose constitution respects individual freedom, and is being used as a pretext not merely to attack ecstatic religions, but to attack scientific research and the very Bill of Rights to that constitution, destroying at once religious freedom, scientific freedom, and the juridical guarantees protecting citizens from governmental arrogance and tyranny. In history as in physics, in the millennial struggle between governmental tyranny and human rights, no action is without an equal and opposite reaction. The reaction to the pharmacratic inquisition was the entheogenic reformation. I take you to the rainforests of West Africa and present-day Gabon, where in the mid-19th century the Fang people were observed to use an entheogenic plant called iboga, tabernanthe iboga. In response to Catholic evangelism and Protestant missionary activity, there evolved among the Fang a syncretism between traditional use of Iboga and Christianity, of which the most prominent manifestation is Buiti. As Fernandez noted, we have in the eating of Iboka a Eucharistic experience with similarities to Christian communion. Members of Buiti practice communion employing Iboka instead of bread, Some of the more Christian branches speak of Iboka as a more perfect and God-given representation of the body of Christ. Buiti revolves around dynamic reinterpretations of biblical myths with the story of Adam and Eve, the tree of life, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which is, of course, Iboga, the Christian trinity, and the deluge being prominent. Giorgio Samorini, who will speak here, one of the first outsiders to be initiated fully into Buiti in Gabon, quoted a remark by a Buitist establishing the place of Buiti in the entheogenic reformation. We are the true Christians. The Catholics have lost the way that leads you to Christ. The missionaries who offer us their insipid host and ask us to abandon Iboga do not know what they are talking about. Could we ask for a more direct statement of the difference between genuine, experiential, ecstatic religion and a watered-down, exsanguinated simulacrum of religion evoked by a placebo sacrament, by an insipid host. During the French colonial regime in Gabon, especially from 1920 through 40, the missionaries, in league with the colonial government, prosecuted a vicious pharmacratic inquisition against Buiti, burning temples and murdering its leaders. Nevertheless, Buiti continued to grow in the face of persecution, identifying with nationalist anti-colonial sentiment, which led to expulsion of the French and founding of the Republic of Gabon, whose first president was a Buitist. Indeed, Buiti has achieved the status of state religion in Gabon, where there are one to 2,000 Buiti temples. Buiti is spreading rapidly across borders and bids fair to become, along with Christianity and Islam, one of the predominant religions of equatorial West Africa. Meanwhile, in North America, the entheogenic reformation was extending its roots into the scorched earth left in the wake of the brutal Union army raised by Abraham Lincoln to preserve the Union. Having trampled the Constitution into the ground in the course of subduing the Confederate army, the awesome military might Lincoln had amassed 
was turned against the hapless indigenous population of the continent, unlike in Mesoamerica and South America, where bloody conquest was followed by a gradual process of mestizaje or miscegenation of European and Indian blood, the U.S. government embarked on a final solution, extermination or imprisonment on reservations, which shrank increasingly to approximate concentration camps of the indigenous population in pursuit of a manifest destiny to control the continent. Mexico and the British crown had already been forced in the 1840s to cede immense territories to the imperialistic government on the Potomac, lands that didn't belong to those governments any more than the rest of the continent belonged to the U.S. government. The Indians fought bravely against superior numbers in arms, then watched helplessly as great chiefs and warriors, whole tribes, were exterminated, watched in stunned amazement as great herds of buffalo, vast roiling seas of large animals, were slaughtered for their skins, the huge meaty bodies which gave them sustenance, left to rot on the dusty prairies. As Labar detailed in the Ghost Dance, the Ghost Dance movements represent the final catastrophe of Indian cultures in the United States. It was the great ghost dance of 1890 which brought down the curtain on traditional Indian shamanic culture. It appears this was a syncretism between ancient northern Paiute beliefs and cyclical renewal of the world and Christian doctrines of the millennium. The futility of even this last desperate attempt to salvage part of their culture became apparent in 1890 when the Teton Dakota Sioux shaman chief Sitting Bull was killed in South Dakota, followed by the massacre of his people at Wounded Knee, putting a sanguine end to Indian resistance to whites. Unlike the swift and brutal military reaction against the Sioux ghost dance, the authorities in Oklahoma allowed the movement to run its course in the first years of the 1890s, Meanwhile, sacramental use of peyote, an important plant sacrament of the Mexican Indians, began to gain a growing foothold in the U.S. In Oklahoma, this use took root in the fertile fields of ghost dance fervor, and on the Kiowa Comanche Reservation, the Cado Delaware shaman John Wilson was a leader both of the ghost dance and the nascent peyote religion. Wilson and Comanche chief Quena Parker were instrumental in the movement which coalesced on 10 October 1918 with the establishment of the Native American Church in Oklahoma. In the peyote cult, Labar noted the complex interweaving of Christian elements and Mexican and Plains Indian beliefs into the new religion. The second article of incorporation of the church states, The purpose is to foster and promote the religious belief of the several tribes of Indians in the state of Oklahoma in the Christian religion with the peyote sacrament and to teach the Christian religion. We mustn't forget Parker's famous dictum. The white man goes into his church house and talks about Jesus, but the Indian goes into his teepee and talks to Jesus. As was the case with Buiti, a latter-day auto de fe of the Pharmocratic Inquisition persecuted the novel religion. It was too late for another extermination campaign. Even land-hungry whites had been shocked by the brutality of the Army's final solution to the Indian problem. Since puritanical prohibitionist forces had already turned to the ballot box in Congress to wage war on inebriants, peyote was included with alcohol, tobacco, and other inebriants in a general legal campaign against drugs, culminating in passage of the Harrison Act in 1914, the 18th Amendment to the Constitution, and the Volstead Act of 1919, which illegalized alcohol itself, although exemption was made for the watered-down vinous sacrament of the Catholics, that even a target of the prohibitionist zealots. Omer Stewart's peyote religion tells the tale of the attempts to take peyote away from the Indians. Although many battles were lost along the way, now in the courts, the Indians successfully resisted attempts to illegalize peyote religion. The Comprehensive Drug Abuse Prevention and Control Act of 1970 classified peyote and its alkaloid mescaline as illicit drugs, but the American Indian Religious Freedom Act of 1978 specifically protects Indian religion, and amendments to this law enacted in 1994 decree that use, possession, or transportation of peyote by an Indian for bona fide traditional ceremonial purposes in connection with the practice of a traditional Indian religion is lawful and shall not be prohibited by the United States or any state. Despite discrimination against Indians in the U.S. and vigorous propaganda campaigns against so-called hallucinogens, like peyote and mescaline, the Native American church continues an inexorable expansion north into Canada and now has more than 250,000 members. Many tribes admit non-Indians to the church, and in 1979, the all-race Peyote Way Church of God incorporated in Arizona. 
The federal government interprets legal exemptions for religious use of peyote in a racist fashion to apply only to Indians or persons with at least 25% Indian blood. Nevertheless, federal court decisions have supported the rights of non-Indians to use peyote as a sacrament, and the next step for the entheogenic reformation in North America is to legitimize rights of all citizens to pursue religious ecstasy with genuine sacraments. (laughs) With far less fanfare than accompanied its first manifestations in Africa and North America, The entheogenic reformation spread quietly in South America for more than half a century before inspiring counterattacks by reactionary forces of the pharmacratic inquisition. Starting in the 1920s in the Brazilian state of Acre, syncretic Christian churches began to appear, employing the pan-Amazonian shamanic entheogenic potion ayahuasca as the host in Christian rituals of communion. Today there are two major and several minor ayahuasca churches in Brazil, the older Santo Daime Church, and the more recent but larger Unia du Vegetal, or UDV. André Lázaro summarized the Santo Daime doctrine, stating quite plainly that, the doctrine of Santo Daime is manifested by way of the ritual use of our sacrament, Daime, also known as ayahuasca. Although the published doctrine of the Unia du Vegetal, or herbal union, does not specifically equate the potion known as Sha Owasca, vine tea, with the Christian Eucharist, it does state, The Unión du Vegetal professes the fundamentals of Christianity. In ritual sessions in its temples, the Udeve employs a tea called Oasca. The effect of the tea might be compared to religious ecstasy. As in the case in Santo Daime, the Udeve potion is administered in the course of mass and religious festivals. Like Daime, Sha Oasca consists of aqueous extracts of stems of the Liana Banisteriopsis Ka'api and leaves of Psychotria viridis. Plants are cultivated in Amazonia to supply the primarily urban churches. The potions prepared in large quantities under the supervision of church mestres. Broadly speaking, the Udeve and Santo Daime have more attributes in common than they have differences, and both are emblematic of the entheogenic reformation of Christianity in South America. After flourishing in obscurity for some decades, this Amazonian entheogenic reformation suddenly was attacked by the pharmacratic inquisition of the Brazilian government. In 1985, Brazilian Dimed and Confen added ayahuasca to the list of prescribed drugs, prompting Udeve to petition Confen to annul the ban. After a governmental commission found no evidence of social disruption associated with sacramental use of ayahuasca, which commission members themselves tried, ayahuasca was removed from the controlled substances list in 1987. The following year, an anonymous denunciation in in Rio de Janeiro prompted Confen again to order technical study of the issue, especially the pharmacology of the potions. Again, ayahuasca and the churches received a clean bill of health, and Confen accepted the conclusions of the study, which recommended ayahuasca potions, as well as their constituent plants, be exempted from the illicit drugs list, which they summarily were in June 1992. Now legitimized in Brazil, The ayahuasca churches continue a steady expansion. In Europe, ayahuasca masses have been celebrated in Madrid, Barcelona, Amsterdam, Munich, Frankfurt, Berlin, several other large cities. This oft-times commercial activity, the church and Christianity sometimes take a back seat in promotional literature, has now generated negative publicity, and it appears some white shamans may be using the name of the Daime Church as a cover for strictly profit-making activities. On the other hand, Santo Daime temples have been established in European cities like Barcelona. The UDV is less given to evangelism, but UDV prenucleos have cropped up in the U.S. and other countries, and the, U- and the UDV has registered legally as a church in at least three American states. Given the current rabid interest in shamanism in the overdeveloped world, these ayahuasca churches have unlimited potential for expansion, assuming they can circumvent the problem of the DMT content of the potions, since DMT is an illicit drug in most countries. It remains to be seen whether European and U.S. residents are genuinely interested in Christian doctrines of Santo Daime and UDV, or are primarily interested in obtaining ayahuasca for their own non-Christian, psychonautic, shamanic self-actualization. Indeed, many people in the contemporary entheogenic drug scene of the industrialized world consider Christianity to be inimical to the ecstatic state, to be, ipso facto, the pharmacratic inquisition, finding in shamanism or pagan religions their sinosure. 
It seems rather that the bulk of my peers in the overdeveloped countries despise Christianity and regard it to be the ecological and theological enemy of the movement, while shamanism, with its emphasis on individual psychonautic vision quests, is the reigning model. It is my impression that contemporary interest in shamanism and theogens in Western countries is the direct counterpart of the syncretic Christian shamanic movements we have examined in Africa and the Americas, that the so-called psychedelic age and the white shaman movement constitute our version of the entheogenic reformation. Besides magazines catering to cannabis habitués and users of entheogens, there are now magazines focusing on shamanism. Shaman's Drum, in particular, is a forum for advertisements by tourist operators promoting peyote tourism to Mexico and ayahuasca tourism to South America. It is the transformation of holy sacrament to crass tourist commodity occasioned by this entheogenic tourism, which leads me to condemn it in no uncertain terms. In Mexico, within two decades of Wasson's unveiling of the shamanic use of sacramental mushrooms, which required two years of patient field work in the same village to bear fruit, the mushrooms were being peddled to tourists in the streets by every urchin in that town. Maria Sabina and some of her Mazatec peers even served jail sentences in Oaxaca City for allegedly pandering to the mushroomic tourist trade. As Maria noted, Before Wasson, I felt that the mushrooms exalted me. Now I no longer feel this. From the moment the strangers arrived, the mushrooms lost their purity. They lost their power. They decomposed. From that moment on, they no longer worked. She even said that they stopped speaking to her in Mazatec and began to speak in English, which she didn't understand. I couldn't express this more decisively or eloquently. It is unspeakably obscene that the Holy Sacrament be thus desecrated, nay, trivialized, that a spiritual adept of Maria Sabina's stature be imprisoned like a common criminal. S. Valadez denounced peyote tourism in the pages of Shaman's Drum, which had featured her Weichel artist husband's work on one of its covers. Westerners who participate in peyote pilgrimages with Weicholes are endangering the Weicholes who escort them. The soldiers patrolling the peyote desert are not impressed by Americans who claim they come for enlightenment. The Mexicans think the outsiders come for dope and accuse the Weicholes of dealing drugs to the gringo hippies. Holy sacrament as trinket and souvenir is bad enough, but as dope, the tragic dimensions of the problem come into sharp focus. Not only do we profane the sacrament, but we debase the shaman, noble practitioner of humankind's oldest profession, into a sleazy dope dealer at the mercy of the police. And it is a distressingly short, slippery step from the inner sanctum to the slammer. While shamanism may be contributing to the entheogenic reformation, to the reform of Christianity in Africa and the Americas, there has been a concurrent Christian deformation of shamanism. When Wasson met Maria Sabina, her shamanic rites were already corrupted by Christian influences. Maria sensed her mushrooms before a crude altar bearing cheap iconic prints of the baptism in Jordan. She said the mushrooms grew where Jesus Christ had spat on the ground. When the holy children spoke to her, it was Jesus speaking, etc. In order that traditional shamanism might live out its last days in peace and dignity, it is imperative that residents of the industrialized world have legal access to shamanic inebriants and ecstatic religions in their own countries. We descendants of Western civilization have just as much right to entheogens as any Weichol or Mazatec or Comanche Indian. Forsooth, we've much more need of them as well. But we've no right to descend on what are, perforce, the least civilized areas of the planet with our money, high-tech gear, and morbid interest in drugs. And if it weren't for the pharmacratic inquisition, if we weren't so desperate, I submit, we simply wouldn't. Could there ever be a more damning indictment of the spiritual bankruptcy of our vaunted Western civilization than the fact that it has transubstantiated the sacred fruit of the tree of life, the veritable wellspring of all culture, into scurvy contraband? Could there ever be a more damning indictment of the spiritual bankruptcy of our vaunted Western civilization than the fact that it has transubstantiated the sacred fruit of the tree of life, the veritable wellspring of all culture, into scurvy contraband? made the truth a secret, the logos a dirty word. Perhaps history really tr <coughs> excuse me, turns in cycles, as Vico proposed in the 18th century, but to his quadripartite scheme of historical cycles, theocratic, aristocratic, democratic, and chaotic, 
We in this chaotic post-Wasson world, with our vastly expanded knowledge of the proto and prehistory of humankind, must needs add a fifth primordial cycle, the shamanic. Appropriately enough, the shamanic cycle embodies the quintessence of our culture, dealing as it does with what Vedic priests called Vak and Greek philosophers Logos, the divine aflatus. In 1872, at the age of 28, Friedrich Nietzsche gave a voice to a brilliant intuition in the birth of tragedy from the spirit of music. Dionysian stirrings arise through the influence of those narcotic potions of which all primitive races speak in their hymns. So stirred, the individual forgets himself completely. Not only does the bond between individual men come to be forged anew by the magic of the Dionysian rite, but nature herself, long alienated or subjugated, rises again to celebrate the reconciliation with her prodigal son, man. Lacking the most rudimentary historical or ethnobotanical data, based solely on intuition inspired by the Pangean sacred potion motifs of ancient hymns, Nietzsche anticipated the Wasson theory by the better part of a century. The great German genius conceived of the ancient Greek dichotomy of the Apollonian and Dionysian worldviews. Thanks to the pioneering work of Karl Ruck, who characterized the Dionysian worldview as the wild and the Apollonian as the cultivated, we now know the ancient Greeks made liberal use of plant and theogens to dissolve temporarily the artificial boundaries of ego implicit in our rational self-conscious thought that yawning chasm between self and other, which isolates each individual human being, not only from her or his fellow Gian creatures, but from other human beings as well. As Albert Hofmann astutely noted, the Greek genius attempted the cure by supplementing the Apollonian worldview created by the subject-object cleavage with the Dionysian world of experience in which this cleavage is abolished in ecstatic inebriation. This is what Nietzsche meant by the reconciliation of the prodigal son, humankind, with Our Lady Gia, from whom we are alienated by ego, by self-consciousness. Indeed, religion did not merely derive from ecstatic inebriation. True religion is ecstasy, this inebriation or heavenly drunkenness of the spirit. The function of religion in human society, reduced to its barest essentials, is to instill in us human beings by grace of ecstasy the certainty of our unity with the universe and our fellow creatures, the unio mystica, to give us faith in the simple truth enunciated by William Blake 203 years ago that everything that lives is holy. The Pharmacratic Inquisition inaugurated by Alaric in A.D. 395 has systematically attempted to annihilate the Dionysian tradition of antiquity, our source of faith and solace to temper the terrible solitude of self-consciousness. As Hofmann further noted, ecclesiastical Christianity, characterized by the duality of creator and creation, has largely obliterated the Eleusinian Dionysian legacy of antiquity. Objective reality, the worldview produced by the spirit of scientific inquiry, is the myth of our time. I would say this duality of subject-object is the superstition of our time, for there is overwhelming scientific and experiential evidence that reassures us we are but one strand in the warp and weft of life, biochemically kindred to other gene life forms and descended from the same primordial ancestors. This is a treacherous superstition which has led to the objectification of our planet and all her gene creatures. Rather than marvel at the eternally ephemeral living miracle that is each and every one of our furry, feathered, leafy, spiny, or scaly brethren, we see only resources to be exploited, and exploit them we do, so ruthlessly that the extinction of plant and animal species, nay of entire habitats, is an everyday occurrence. And by the time it dawns on us, if it ever does, that we too are on the endangered species list, it may be a trifle too late. For scientific hypermaterialism celebrates its apocalyptic marriage to Judeo-Christian dualism in a mesmerizing last tango on the deck of the Titanic, a ghastly dance macabre or totentance, while we watch, awe-stricken. This is where the entheogenic reformation comes into the picture, restoring to humankind its millennial healing balsam for the lesions of materialism, its traditional key to ecstasy or the withdrawal of the soul from the body, 
the ineffable, spiritual, non-materialistic state of being in which the universe is perceived more as energy or spirit than as matter, Blake's eternal delight, the archetypal religious experience, the heart and soul of shamanism, wellspring of all culture. While Christianity, with its decretum horribile of humankind as a special creation, separate from the rest of the universe and enjoined, moreover, to subdue and dominate the planet with this disastrous core superstition and all of the cataclysmic ecological destruction it has wrought, seems particularly evocative of the entheogenic reformation. There is some evidence for a sort of archaic revival in parts of the world that have largely escaped the bane of Christian evangelism. The classical scholar Mary Barnard commented on the work of Gordon Wasson. Looking at the matter coldly, unintoxicated and unentranced, I am willing to prophesy that 50 theobotanists working for 50 years would make the current theories concerning the origins of much mythology and theology as out of date as pre-Copernican astronomy. Although those who might call themselves theobotanists, or perhaps more appropriately, entheobotanists, number fewer than 50 worldwide, and we yet have nearly two decades to go, I would say Barnard's prophecy is on a sure footing. Wasson declared in 1986, just before he died, that we are well beyond the stage of hypotheses, and four years later I referred for the first time to the Wasson theory of the genesis of religions in ecstatic states provoked by entheogenic plants, comparing Wasson rather to Charles Darwin than to Copernicus. Just as Darwin's theory of natural selection provided a natural mechanism to explain the historical fact of evolution, Wasson's theory suggested a natural mechanism to explain the historical fact that strikingly similar religious concepts arose independently in diverse parts of the terraqueous globe in proto-history, having certain Pangean motifs relating to ecstatic communion with the entheogens, the use of which has likewise been shown to be common virtually to all cultures studied, of the oxys mundi, or world tree, tree of life, tree of the knowledge of good and evil, etc., with its sacred fruit, of communion with the sacrament, of the soul's separability from the body, of the other world. Just as a few fanatical believers in one or another religion to this day refuse to accept Darwin's theory of evolutionary mechanisms in spite of the overwhelming evidence in its favor, so fanatical believers in one or another religion may refuse to accept the Wasson theory, however much evidence we entheobotanists might adduce in its favor. On the other hand, as surely as scientific opinion changed to accept Darwin's theory as being more plausible than the reigning Judeo-Christian belief in special creation, which defied all the evidence of science in our senses, so too will scientific opinion inexorably come to accept the Wasson theory as being more plausible than the alternative, that the little toy room picture of the Bible, to use Joseph Campbell's term, or the provincial found truth of any other god or chosen people has a greater claim on reality or the alternative of Eliot and others who, as Barnard expressed it, quote, put the desire for an afterlife and the belief in an imaginary nectar of immortality before the experience of actual plants and beverages used in the ceremonial communion with the gods or the ancestors, unquote, which he justifiably likened to putting Medea's chariot before her team of serpents. I will venture to make my own prophecy even more polemical than Barnard's. Assuming, which is by no means assured, that our civilization survives another millennium, Christianity and such like symbolic dogmatic religions will prosper only by forsaking the pharmacratic inquisition and embracing the entheogenic reformation with open arms. Only thus, restoring the true sacrament, a genuine agape, the very heart and soul, yea, the central mystery, to such exsanguinated, purely theoretical would-be religions, might they recover their spiritual authenticity, hence their meaning and relevance for humankind. Only by abandoning what Blake called their pale religious lechery, that ancient curse of the blackening church, only by ceasing their binding with briars of all human joys and desires, only by admitting that spiritual truth is not some dogma thundered in stentorian tones from the eminence of any pulpit, but more a murmur in the heart, a whisper on the night, barely heard over the sigh of the wind in the trees, or the trilling ricochet of rain in their leafy filigree, only by letting the word speak for itself, by ceding every pulpit to the primeval vac, the primigenial logos, allowing the gentle breezes of the divine afflatus, 
to fill the psychonautic sails of the indomitable human spirit, perpetually embarking on odysseys of discovery in the universe of the soul, on Gilgamesh's epic pursuit of the wondrous plant of immortality, Jason's errant search for the golden fleece, Ponce de Leon's quixotic quest for the pool of living water, the quintessential elixir of life, the philosopher's stone of immortality. In conclusion, I'd like to offer a brief extract from a work in progress, uh, which is, the book is entitled Pharmacophilia, or The Natural Paradises, to get to the title of my talk at last. Uh, and this extract is called Phytomphalos. Of course, there uh, neologism phyto for plant, and omphalos is the, is the tree of life or the oxys mundi, that navel literally in Greek, but omphalos was the name of a sculpture in the temple of Apollo at Delphi on Parnassos in Greece, which marked the center, the axis about which the universe turned. And I wish to offer this in the context of opening this conference as a sort of invocation to the plant powers, whether we may wish to conceive of them as plant spirits or as alkaloids or other plant secondary compounds, phytomphalos. Psychonauts or cosmonauts, they came from beyond the Milky Way aboard Anaconda Canoe, our primordial parents. The Dasana call her Gapi Maso, the Ahe woman, ascending the mighty rivers of the upper Amazon, fecund serpents of the soil, even to the hoary rock of Niyi on the Pira Parana, there on the equator, so they say, there to people the planet. From beyond the Milky Way they came, psycho-cosmonauts, Anaconda canoe-born on Apicondia, the river of milk, where the house of the waters stood, there to people the planet. Anaconda canoe also bore a precious verdant cargo, exotic plants, some say, from beyond the Milky Way, just three, cassava, ipadu, and yahe, to sustain our bodies, minds, and spirits. Here is the real trinity. Of this we can be certain. For our lives, like most life on this planet, hang on threads of plants, green leafy lifelines, twixt planetary dust and stellar fire, not on the whims of some wizened gray-beard god, thrown enthralled, fight alchemical wizards, conjuring life from streaming photons and dancing dust devils, even out of thin air. Such are our progenitors. How right the Tucanoan Indians were to reduce the essentials of our creation to those three plants, succor for body, mind, and spirit, our phytotrinity, our phytomphalos. Cassava root, succulent, starchy, to stoke the electron fires that roil our blood and sweeten our brains. Ipadu, toothsome coca, energy ensconcing, leaf and love, to strengthen our bodies and nourish our minds. And yahe, or ayahuasca, Heaven home helix, strand of spirits, gene like gyre of generations untold, guiding our hearts here and now. This is our true trinity, of which is woven our warp of blood and bone and sinew as surely as our weft of culture, art, and history. Of such leafy stuff are we made, there can be no doubt. Some say the river of milk was the Jordan, not the Pira Parana, or the Ganga Yamuna, or Mississippi, for the universe is indeed wider than our views of it. But the milk is the same, washed shores it might. It is the milk of plantly kindness, freely flowing from the roots of the cosmic tree, Phytomphalos, where the very heavens turn. Ni Yi or Delphi doesn't matter. Mimer's well, or fountain of youth, or water of life, or lake of milk. Soma milk, birch maiden breast born, it's all the same. Font of culture, tree of life, phytomphalos, our connection to Pangea, without which, nor are we. Phytomphalos grows not in some geocircumscribed garden, not in Eden, nor on Parnassos, nor indeed the shores of Sarya Navat, not merely, but on most every square centimeter of Our Lady Gia's glorious body, all sacred ground. Our paradise is bound only by her vaporous breath and just barely, by thin air. The cherubim gate-guarding flaming swords, naught but ignorant ego and pious prejudice, paltry human stuff. Some dare call our natural paradises artificial, our one true religion an inferior form of mysticism. O oh, pitiable, foolish young men, 
Nothing could be farther from the truth, no lie bigger. What could be more natural than to sip culture direct from Memer's well as our foremothers did and whence it first flowed, even as our fellow creatures do all round us? What could be more artificial than to forsake experience in dogma's favor, dogged, doggerel dogma, musty, fossilized human stuff, to fell fight omphalos and erect a temple in its gardeny glen, yea, hew coarse beams and hack poor pews of that very living umbilicus, oh, and ghastly coffins, too, then bury our dead in the sacred ground, our foolish actions defiled, desecrating it? Talk of heaven, ye disgrace earth. William Blake called our natural paradise the garden of love and road of its human despoilation. And I saw it was filled with graves and tombstones where flowers should be and priests in black gowns were walking their rounds and binding with briars my joys and desires. So the artificial became natural, the truly natural artificial. The lie was consummated, and our college of artificer augurs solemnly proclaimed black to be white and white black when humankind once trusted its eyes and such lenses as Phytomphalos provided. Shut out from the natural paradises, the way even to the artificial blocked by toll-takers and foolish dogmatists, humankind was bereft in a wilderness of its own making, burning or beatifying the few who still found their way back. A wise being called it the end of living and the beginning of survival. From natural paradise to artificial hell, falling into history, the nightmare from which we are all struggling to awake. But Phytomphalos had sunk its roots deep into Pangaea, far deeper than the rotting veneer of human stuff, deeper even than we might dig, down into the human brain, profounder than thought, even to the strata of instinct and desire. There it set its seeds year after year, generations passing like the moons, ages blowing in the winds, eons adrift on a river of time whose thin current slides away while eternity remains, washed clean by the years. There on the ever-shrinking frontiers of human habitation, here in the very shadow of the church, in the biggest humanscape on the shining face of Pangaea. We die, our cultures die. The very words we weave worlds of perish, but Phytomphalos persists in many of its protean forms, for it is the very texture of eternity, woven not of words but the stuff of stars, the divine afflatus breathed into it by the solar wind. Fiery star stuff made cool green life in the watery alembic of the bluest planet in this corner of the universe. We are indeed like giants plunged into the years. We are that roiling and sonorous, yet shallow, thin current that slides away over the sandy bottom of eternity in which Phytomphalos has sunk its roots. Whether we choose to founder or to navigate this Amazon of the eons, we cannot resist its fearsome course. No anaconda canoe bears us upstream. Fight alchemical, fight eternal, sepultured even beneath the slow, steady accretion of 1,600 annular rings of human folly. Protean fight omphalos, indifferent to history, loving even the shadows, inartificial, archaic, anarchic, yet nurtured its kind, set its seed in sub-historical strata of Lady Gia's lush loins, even in human history, faint fossilized frond prints on the strands of our words, fabric of our reality, on that repertory of wood notes wild. Could we but attune ourselves to the faint descant that rises from them, we could hear the ethereal echo of its Icaro. Listen. Yes, you can hear it still a whisper on the night, sighing in the trees of language, leafy rustle of solar wind afflatus, wind song, tree sighs, whispering on the night, sooth sighing, song saying, wind sighing, whispery on the night eternal. There is the soothing music of this Gian sphere, sensuous, sonorous, sooth song. Casting its siren song on the winds of language, setting its seed in subhistorical, subneural strata, Phytomphalos endured, plant patient, strong, ever ready for some magic moment when that manimal communicant, awestruck, head bowed, 
with trembling fingers should touch the tender petals of its fecund fragrant flower and bid them open for long hours to inhale the aroma of its peculiar dreams into a marveling and bewildered being. Phytochemical plant patient pedagogue, protean stuff of stars, font of language, culture, art, wind whispers sighing in its leafy branches, ages blowing in the solar wind over the shallow stream of time, years washing eternity to its siren song, dusty, delicate dance prints on the wind-blown fabric of our word-woven worlds, divine afflatus, lofting, languid, longing, Lorelei love songs, loin-lush logos lambent on leafy limbs of language, soothsighing, soaring Icaro, rotting veneer of feeded human stuff, so much fertilizer for its omnigean roots, compost of culture. And all the while we die, we cultures die, we word-woven, world-weft, word-web wind whispers wither and waste away, way a waste away, a whence we came, windy dust wafted away along a milky river of suns down to a starry sea. Amazon of the eons, torrent of time, corporal canoes caroming chaotically in Kronos's current and cataract, colossal giants plunged into its course, Ceaseless current of years, cataract of centuries cascading, sliding over sandy shoals, sempiternal, down the milky river of the galaxy, its bottom pebbly with stars. Heaven home helix, gene-like, generations gyring like moons, ages blowing, eons adrift, tree of life, root sunk deep in the astral bottom of time, tendering its trenchant trunks, to tether our time-tossed triremes, corporal canoes, mind masts flying spirit spinnakers, running ever downwind, reaching to that milky haven of heaven, its bottom pebbled with stars, solar wind-blown stardust, setting sail on a swirling sea of suns. Stalwart fight eternal fight omphalos, plant strong, protean, puissant, laughing logos lustral on its leafy limbs, tendering tethers to time-tossed timorous triremes, wizened Oaxacan wise woman, logos leaping from lady lush loins, language loquacious on the loin lush ground, wind whispers, sooth sighing, tree song, timber eternal tethery tendrils, leafy living logos lying latent, listener longing. Listen, yes, you can hear it still. Icaros echoing eternal on the solar wind. Fight alchemical pedagogues, fight eternal. Plant patient star stuff. Heavenly haven pebbly with suns. Starshine on aqueous alembic harboring heaven home helix. Stardust to sail on a milky river of time. Fight omphalos, plant persisting. Fragrant fecund flowers opening to our tremulous touch, nectar needing. Tenderling tethers, tendering tree songs, silken on the nectary <clears throat> night. Excuse me. Listen, oh, listen. Can't you hear its dulcet song? All you have to do is listen and dream. Logos, lofting on the solar breeze, listener longing. Logos, leaping loquacious from the loin lush landscape. Logos, lambent over Eon's Amazon, Apicondia, Milky River of Stars. Time-tossed triremes reaching for home, running down wind to a heavenly haven, star striving. Oh, listen, do. Tree song, wind whispers, sooth sighing, tether tendering, solar wind lilting leaf and logos, nectar wafting on the star milky night, tree sighs stirring in the branches of language, ambrosia welling up from deep sunk roots, anchored in the star sandy substrate of time, astral alembic of eons, ever-flowing milky river. Listen, yes, and dream. Drink dream draughts of astral amrita. Drink, dream to its insistent Icaro, rilling riverine reveries, star-bottomed. I thank you for your attention. <laughs> Thank you. 
You're listening to the Psychedelic Salon, where people are changing their lives one thought at a time. Before I forget to say it, if there is one single book in the English language that sits at the very pinnacle of the Psychedelic Index, it's Jonathan Ott's Pharmacotheon, in Theogenic Drugs, Their Plant Sources and History. I have to admit that I don't own a copy myself, well, because it's really expensive. <laughs> but uh, some of my friends have copies, and uh, over the years when I've visited them, I've been able to read much of this significant work. So if you intend to only own one book about psychedelics in your life, well, that's it. There really is uh, no way that I know of to pass along an accurate impression of Jonathan. For one thing, his intellect is so bright that he can come off somewhat scary at times. But at other times, when he's passing around the latest concoction that he's come up with for everybody to test, well, then he's just one of the guys. But I don't know of any other person alive yet today who comes even close to having done the in-depth fieldwork and testing of psychotropic substances than has Jonathan. And did you know that, along with Jeremy Bigwood, Danny Staples, Richard Evan Schultes, R. Gordon Wasson, and Carl Ruck, that Jonathan was also a part of that group who coined the word entheogen. And as you just heard, it was uh, Carl Ruck who also wrote The Road to Eleusis, Unveiling the Secret of the Mysteries, along with uh, Albert Hoffman and R. Gordon Wasson. Now, I'm sure that I've talked about that book in past podcasts, but if you haven't yet read it, then, well, I think you owe it to yourself to do so. In my opinion, it presents the best case yet of explaining the psychoactive rights that were involved during the more than 2,000-year history of people participating in the Eleusinian Mysteries, which have been suggested to have been the actual foundation for Western civilization, uh, as we just heard Jonathan describe. In fact, uh, it seems now almost to be common knowledge that is uh, bantered about by people that I've met at conferences that, uh, of course, Western civilization was founded upon the knowledge gained from participation in the mysteries. And we know that Plato and his philosopher buddies uh, also participated in the mysteries. But for the past 2,000 years or so, this knowledge about the true source of our philosophy has been hidden and kept secret by the priests who claim that we need to go through them in order to have a conversation with the mysterious other rather than do it directly through the use of our psychedelic medicines. And all of this is already well known and accepted by most people who have taken the time to look into the subject. But there's actually more to this story than just Eleusis. Which first of all brings up something that I want to remind you about once again. I do a lot of talking here in the salon, but I don't want you to think that I'm any kind of an expert on anything. You see, while I do have a Bachelor of Science degree in Electrical Engineering, and I do have a Doctor of Jurisprudence degree as well, both from prestigious universities, those places were not where I was educated. I was trained to be an engineer, and I was trained to be a lawyer. But education and training are two different things. My education comes from doing a lot of traveling, living in different parts of this country, working at a number of different occupations, and uh, reading several thousand books. In other words, uh, like most of us working class people, I'm self-educated. So for the rest of today's podcast, uh, as I'm talking about things that I happen to think that I know something about, at least at this moment, well, I could be completely wrong. (laughs) And figuring out whether or not I'm right or wrong is going to be your job, uh, should what I'm about to say have some interest for you. And again, you probably won't hear much about this in your college philosophy courses. Or uh, (laughs) maybe you will. I I actually have no idea what they're teaching in philosophy class these days, uh, now that I think about it. Anyway, uh, as you and a good many of our fellow saloners most likely know already, there is a professor named Peter Kingsley, who is one of our leading experts on an ancient philosopher named Parmenides. Now, Parmenides was a little older than Socrates, and uh, he actually may have been one of Socrates' teachers. And even though he wasn't from Athens, uh, we know for sure that he nonetheless had an impact on Plato's work. Now, Peter Kingsley has written two books that I recommend and will link to in the program notes for today's podcast, uh, which you will find at psychedelicsalon.com. 
And in today's program notes, I'll also link to a 20-minute video by Kingsley that puts Parmenides in a better perspective. In my opinion, these are uh, very important books for people who are interested in learning more about how we humans in the West have managed to get ourselves into such a pickle. But here's the thing. As far as I know, not only has formal Western education blotted out the true foundation of our society, namely the psychedelic trance, even Dr. Kingsley seems to uh, skip around this issue somewhat, which is uh, something that I find equally important as our beginnings at Eleusis. It seems that Parmenides was not only a philosopher and teacher, he was also deeply involved in another mystery rite that circled the Mediterranean at the same time as were the Eleusinian mysteries. It was called Incubation. Right now I'm going to uh, read you a couple short bits from two sources about Incubation. And as I read, try to think between the lines that I'm reading and see if you don't come up with a thought or two that the professional scholars may have left out. The first source is Wikipedia, which says, Incubation is the religious practice of sleeping in a sacred area with the intention of experiencing a divinely inspired dream or cure. Incubation was practiced by many ancient cultures. Modern practices for influencing dream content by dream incubation utilize more research-driven techniques, but they sometimes incorporate elements reflecting these ancient beliefs. Now I'll read a couple quotes from Peter Kingsley's book, Reality. He begins by quoting Parmenides' famous poem, which is about a trip to the underworld and contains the line, And the goddess welcomed me kindly. Now Kingsley then says that most scholars explain away Parmenides' uh, story about a journey as nothing more than a rhetorical device, an allegory. However, Kingsley tells us why this is mistaken and that Parmenides was actually describing a real journey into the underworld that is experienced by participants in the incubation process. Here's a little more detail, and uh, this is another quote from Kingsley's book. And again, uh, see if you can't read between the lines here. And I quote, There was a specific and established technique among various groups of people for making the journey to the world of the dead, for dying before you died. It involved isolating yourself in a dark place, lying down in complete stillness, staying motionless for hours or days. First the body would go silent, then eventually the mind. And this stillness is what gave access to another world, a world of utter paradox, to a totally different state of awareness. Sometimes the state was described as a kind of a dream. Sometimes it was referred to as like a dream, but not a dream, as really a third type of consciousness, quite different from either waking or sleeping. There used to be a whole technical language associated with the procedure, an entire mythical geography, and there was a name that the Greeks and then the Romans gave to this technique. They called it incubation. End quote. But what would you call it? To me, it sounds like a trip. <laughs> and that, my friends, is what was stamped out when the Christians modified what is now called Western civilization. Our task, the task of the worldwide psychedelic community is to reestablish, uh, not just in the West, but everywhere on Earth, another golden age when psychedelic consciousness has its place in our culture, as it did at the very beginning of human history. Like it or not, whether you are a young student right now or an older person like myself, like it or not, those of us who do know about the psychedelic state of consciousness that informed our ancestors, we must do our part to keep the current psychedelic renaissance alive. What we do will most likely be insignificant, but I feel that it's very important that it be done. And for now, this is Lorenzo signing off from Cyberdelic Space. Be well, my friends. <laughs>